Good evening, and it's time for the news. You're with me, Chawes Banda. First, the headlines. Former Malawi leaders pay tribute to Zambia's Kenneth Kaunda, who has died aged 97. Muslims and Christians sign a memorandum of understanding on the wearing of hijabs in school. High Court orders the restart of the 10 million Malawi Kwacha abuse case involving former mayor boss Collins Magasi. We have these and other stories. Do stay with us. Former Malawi presidents Bakiri Mluzi and Joyce Banda have said they will remember former president of Zambia, Kenneth Kaunda, as an icon for Africa. Kaunda, who led Zambia to independence, has died at the age of 97. He was being treated for pneumonia in a hospital in the capital, Lusaka, according to his heirs. Affectionately known as KK, he was one of the last surviving figures from Africa's post-Second World War anti-colonial movement. Earlier in the week, Zambia's president, Eddie Galungu, and several other African leaders had asked people to pray for Kaunda. Muslims and Christians in the country have on Thursday signed a Memorandum of Understanding, MOU, on the wearing of hijab in schools. The Kwasi Religious Body Public Affairs Committee, PAC, facilitated the signing ceremony of the agreement in Blantyre, which will see Christian-owned schools allowing female Muslim learners to wear hijabs in school. The recommendation in the MOU also states that PAC should deal with concerns of Rastafarians, Bible believers, and other concerned faith groups. Liwene Impasa has filed this report, which is read by Justin Mkweo. The Memorandum of Understanding, MOU, is between the Episcopal Conference of Malawi, ISM, the Malawi Council of Churches, MCC, and the Evangelical Association of Malawi, EAM. They have reached an agreement on behalf of Christians and Muslims in the country. The MOU has been developed with hopes of creating a conducive learning environment for Muslim learners in assisted Christian schools seeking to promote the spirit of religious coexistence, conflict prevention and tolerance between different faith groups. Speaking on the sidelines of the ceremony, Minister of Education Agnes Nyalonje said the state shall ensure that all girls go to school and that no girl child is denied access to education or discriminated against on the grounds of religion. So my ministry is going to make sure that uh, uh, we, we go through the normal channels to sit and look at uh, what we're going to do as ministry and what others are going to do. And because we, as Ministry of Education, we do not only have the role of providing education, but we're also a regulating uh, authority for education, which means that uh, there will be various uh, platforms through which we will take the uh, uh, recommendations forward. Park Vice Chairperson Osman Karim said all schools and Association of Christians Educators in Malawi, ACEM, shall enforce that all learners must wear school uniforms as determined by the proprietor and that learners are allowed to wear hijabs as long as the colors match with that of the school uniform. Well, the way forward is obviously to take the memorandum of understanding to the people up to where it, the grassroots are. So our leaders will be briefed on the memorandum and they will take it to the next level until where it reaches the people in the village. So that they are the implementers, they are the ones that will, must implement the MOU, they must the one, be the ones that have uh, feel secure and feel comfortable that the MOU is working and that, that's, the, that's the constituency that uh, will play a key role in making sure that this prevails out of this MOU. The ceremony was witnessed by Minister of Education Agnes Nyalonje, National Unity Minister Timothy Mtambo, UN Senior Human Rights Advisor to Malawi, Sabina Lauba, and civil society representatives. The High Court in Lilongwe has ordered the restart of the trial in which former Chief Executive Officer of the Malawi Energy Regulatory Authority, Mera, Collins Maglasi, is accused of abusing over 10 million kwacha in 2018. Lawyer for Maglasi and De Kaonga applied to the High Court for review of proceedings in the lower court on April 20, 2021 
in his absence. Odrika Palamula has the details. On 19th April this year, Kaonga, who is lawyer for Magalasi in the 10 million Kwacha case, requested the senior resident magistrate court to adjourn the case, which was scheduled for the following day because he had another matter before the Mzuzu High Court. The senior resident magistrate court, however, proceeded with the case in which the state paraded one witness. Kaonga applied to the High Court for the retrial of the matter for Magalasi to undergo a fair trial. In her ruling delivered in chamber on Thursday, Justice Annabelle Ntalimanja ordered the restart of the trial. Both Kaonga and spokesperson for DPP, Piliane Masinjala, confirmed the ruling. The state is expected to parade seven witnesses. Magalasi is accused of abusing office when he allegedly spent mirrors over 10 million kwacha on accommodation for Democratic Progressive Party officials. According to the charges, the money was released on pretext that it would be used for sensitization meeting. The Employers' Consultative Association of Malawi, ECAM, has launched a task force in partnership with the International Labour Organization, ILO, to combat the effects of the COVID pandemic on child labour. This comes as the new global child labour estimates show that mal the malpractice is on the increase with the effects of COVID pandemic on the economy, threatening to intensify as a result. The findings are in a report published last week jointly by the ILO and the United Nations Children's Fund, UNICEF. Yamikan Kachaje has the details. The task force will promote child labor elimination policies and practices across the private sector. Aside from ECOM, it will comprise members such as NBS Bank, T Association of Malawi, PTC, Project Innovation Center, Kasintula Cane Growers Limited, Save the Children, Mzuzu Coffee, Malawi Institute of Education, NASFAM, and the Tobacco Processors Association. ECOM Executive Council Member Annie Chavula noted that the COVID-19 pandemic has contributed to the increase in child labor cases. Uh, because of our households wanting to survive, they've now involved their children to work so that they bring extra income to the home, which uh, we are coming against to say that, no, please, let the children go to school and not let, let the children should not be the, uh, the bread makers. International Labor Organization Senior Project Officer Dylan Van Tromp say the recent global child labor statistics are worrying. But globally speaking, child labor has actually increased. We were winning the fight against child labor. The numbers of children in child labor globally were going down, and we had pushed it down to around 150 million children. This estimate is showing now more than 160 million children in child labor, an increase of around 9 million children since the um, previous publication. The most recent National Child Labor Survey, conducted in 2015, found 38% of children between the ages 5 to 17 were involved in child labor. Research by the National Planning Commission, NPC, shows there is a high rate of failure among Malawian children at the elementary education level because they receive little education. The findings were presented in Lilongwe on Wednesday when experts discussed three solutions recommended by the study. The research has been done with technical assistance from African Institute for Development Policy and Copenhagen Consensus Center. Matthews Cassander has the details. The findings show that less than a quarter of learners in Standard 2 pass English assessments, while only 40% pass mathematics examinations. NPC says it carried out the research because it identifies education as one of the biggest priorities to the attainment of inclusive wealth creation and safe reliance by 2063. As a solution to the education challenges, the research has recommended the introduction of technology-assisted learning in primary schools, in-service teacher training and school feeding programs. Andrew Jamali is NPC research manager. Yeah, so our interventions have really clearly said uh, or indicated that uh, if Malawi can focus on these three interventions, the quality of primary school education will be improved. We have to go technology, but we have to go technology with what is feasibly possible. Director of Basic Education in the Ministry of Education, Grace Milner, says the three interventions are already part of the education sector investment plan. 
technology learning assistance, we have a, a project whereby learners in primary school are using tablets and it's in pilot districts. So after piloting, that's when we can roll out that. Education expert Steve Shira says the cost-benefit study shows that the country needs to be careful in prioritizing what it invests in. Right. So what the, this study, cost-benefit analysis study, has shown is that as a country, we really need to be very, very careful in prioritizing what we invest in. Because, you know, we have got limited resources. The research shows that for every one equacha invested on technology-assisted learning, the country will get back 106 equacha. This is Times News. We'll be back with more after the break. Soccer is here, and becoming the Premier Bet Soccer Hero is all about making the right selections. It's time to trust your natural instincts to believe in yourself. Be brave. Because there's the Premier Bet jackpot of $100,000 for the taking. So never give up. Bet now and receive up to a 250% win bonus. Premier Bet Soccer Hero. It's all in the selections. If there's one thing that all soaps do, it's wash. From buckets to basins, bathrooms to streams, and everything in between. <laughs> all soaps wash. Yes, but Protex is different. Its reinvented formula with flaxseed oil boosts your skin's natural anti-germ defenses by 10 times more, protecting you against 99.9% .9 of germs. So what keeps us healthy? Protex! Good health starts here. Welcome back. Bereaved families of July 20, 2011 anti-government demonstrations have resolved to bar government and other politicians from patronizing this year's memorial service because of what they call frustration with their lives. The families made and agreed not to extend an invitation to the government and any other politicians for the event that takes place on July 20 annually at Zolo Zolo Cemetery in Mzuzu City. From Mzuzu, Sam Kalimira reports. Spokesperson for the believed families, Mese Mbesuma Fune, said politicians take advantage of such ceremonies to promise the families total support but never leave their pledges. This year's patrons will be drawn from the church and the civil society organizations, according to Mbesuma. Indeed, families are very frustrated and they are not happy because each and every year when it comes, 20 July, uh, we remember those who lost their lives, those who were killed with the police officers. So it, it has come like a song, huh? promising those people that uh, we are here, we are speaking against the government. Like last year, it was uh, the, during DPP's reign. They, they were promising many things of which as I'm talking now, they are happened to fulfill what they were promising. But Minister of Civic Education and National Unity, Timothy Ntambo, said the families should be patient as the current administration cannot resolve all the issues which happened during the reign of previous governments at a go. Dambo, who also patronized last year's memorial service, stressed that the government is still committed to support the families, but after formulating proper legal framework. Currently, the families have also expressed concern that some people have started encroaching part of the graveyard, calling on authorities to act. The government compensated nine families with 31 million kwacha after the issue was taken to court. 
United Nations Resident Coordinator for Malawi, Maria Jose Torres, has stressed the need to empower women economically to protect them from gender-based violence. The call has been made following concerns that poverty and illiteracy are contributing highly to the increase in gender-based violence in communities. Feston Malekezo has a report. Speaking at Intende Primary School in Zimba at a Spotlight Initiative event, Torres said it is high time all stakeholders work together in empowering and protecting women and girls. Torres adds that the efforts that have been realized in terms of decreasing numbers of child marriages and gender-based violence after implementation of the Spotlight Initiative in Zimba District is for the benefit of all Malawians. I believe there is no single institution that can address all the challenges mentioned today, whether it's distance, lack of infrastructure, uh, lack of funding. And I, I really like the commitment expressed by the Speaker of Parliament. I think it's extremely important that uh, Katerinko Taringhara, the right honourable speaker, is here today, together with the Minister, to really find ways that Malawi can really take seriously this type of intervention. In her remarks, Patricia Gariati, Minister of Gender, Community Development and Social Warfare, said Spotlight Initiative comes in handy as it is encouraging reporting of sexual related crimes among others. Spotlight Initiative is in 24, this is 24 countries and uh, the eight countries in Africa, one of the African countries is Malawi. So we are really honored that they are implementing in six districts. We have asked them if they can meet all the women members of parliament and uh, link up with this program to them that we can popularize it in all the processes whether these women are coming from and parade them as their models to the girls. And you know, Asan Glower, Executive Director of Action Aid Malawi, which is one of the implementing partner of the initiative, said GBV needs urgent attention. The Mat Year Spotlight Initiative, embarked by UN and European Union, aims at eliminating all forms of violence against women and girls across the country. In international news, when leaders from the world's wealthiest nations met at the G7 summit in Cornwall, England, over the weekend, they announced a vaccine-sharing initiative that would see a billion shots spread across the world. Now it's up to aid and advocacy groups to overcome vaccine hesitancy. More in this VOA report. This weekend, leaders have pledged over one billion doses. That is the promise from the world's wealthiest countries to help some of the world's poorest countries combat COVID-19. The number falls well short of the 11 billion vaccine doses that Oxfam says is needed, calling the G7 summit a failure. The G7 had a huge opportunity to actually deliver a global roadmap towards fully vaccinating the world. What we've seen is warm words and very little action. Eloise Todd is co-founder of the Pandemic Action Network. She says numerous hurdles exist to get those billion doses into arms. There's this kind of three prongs really to the vaccine strategy, which is procurement, buying the vaccines, delivery, getting them to a place where you can get them in people's arms, not only on the tarmac in the country, but do you have the healthcare workers, the community workers to be able to do that? And then crucially, willingness to receive the vaccine. Outreach programs to vaccinate communities in developing countries revolve around trusted endorsements from leaders, influencers and health workers. If the health workers at the local level who the communities trust, right, have actually seen that, I mean, have, have communicated that, listen, I'm taking the, I'm taking care of you, but I'm taking the vaccines because I trust the science, I trust the efficacy. That itself is reinforcing the belief in that, in the, in the vaccines. Edwin Ikuoria is Africa Executive Director for the One Campaign. He says as more people get vaccinated, hesitancy will drop. People become ambassadors because the fear is that if, I, if, you, if you take it, you will die. If you take it, you will be sterilized. If you take it, all kinds of things. So when people who have taken the vaccines also come out to talk about the benefits of how they have, how their life is going back to normal, how they are not afraid, how they are also, you know, uh, uh, you know, living healthier and all of that, they become a part of the whole program of getting others who are not, you know, to uh, to come on board. The experts say success overcoming hesitancy in developing countries ultimately depends on having enough vaccines and enough people to administer them. Arash Arabasadi, VOA News. That's the news for now, but before we go, the headlines once again.
Former Malawi leaders paid tribute to Zambia's Kenneth Kaunda, who has died at the age of 97. Muslims and Christians signed a memorandum of understanding on the wearing of hijab in schools. High Court orders the restart of 10 million kwacha abuse case involving former mayor boss Collins Magalasi. Remember, you can get more on these and other stories by visiting our website www.times.mw, liking our Facebook page Times 360 Malawi and following us on Twitter at Times 360 Malawi. Remember to wash your hands regularly, observe social and physical distance and mask up. Please stay safe. You have been with me, Jawes Banda. Have a lovely evening.